Jason Brown. You can find me on Twitter at Brown Jason. Joined once again by the boys, Dr. Eric Eager. How are you doing this evening, my man? Hey, I'm doing great. Uh, got some papers to grade, but aside from that, uh, there's some nice action on here in the background, so you can't can't lose. All right, all right. And uh, and Luke, how's it going? Taking a little break from breaking down the Rams to uh, to come on with us this evening. How you doing, my man? Pretty good. Yeah, I, I I'm just having a lot of fun watching. I'm really excited for this game. Good stuff. Good stuff. I guess yeah. You it's uh you get to talk probably actually get to talk a little bit of smack before this one to some people who actually care. I know one Rams fan. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, before we jump into the the, the topic that we kind of uh, agreed previously that we were going to talk about tonight, um, you dropped an awesome piece today at uh, Purple PTSD, kind of looking at how the Vikings should go through the process of making the decision between Case Keenum and, and Teddy Bridgewater, maybe a little bit differently than I'd seen, you know, really anyone else really go at it. So uh, I guess if you could just uh, kind of walk us through the piece, take us through the premise, and then we can have a quick chat on that before we jump into talking about some offensive line stuff. Yeah, I wanted to talk about um, just sort of the logic of really any decision, and this is a pretty good example that we're kind of in the middle of right now, but any decision where you kind of have to decide whether or not put someone in or employ a strategy that you don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, and there's a really good principle in economics of like game theory and a good example called the prisoner's dilemma, which you can learn all about in that article. I'm really like to explain that to people. It's, like, it's, like, you know, it's super interesting and it's explained right. Um, but I wanted to kind of use that as a way of like laying out, you know, we don't know how good Teddy Bridgewater is. You know, the team might have a pretty good idea of, of how they've seen him practice and stuff, but we, we don't know. There's a lot we don't know about him. Um, and you can still approach the decision kind of chalking him up to an uncertainty. You can still approach the decision in a way that like makes sense without trying to evaluate or like guess how he's going to do a game speed and all these other kind of certain factors that, that people have been talking about throughout this whole debate. Um, so yeah, go, go check that piece out. It's, it's kind of laying things out um, in, a, in a more like accounting for all possible outcomes sort of way. And essentially by the end of it, what I tried to lay out was whether he's good or bad, there's enough upside to like, even if he's bad, just like learning that and understanding that and I'm not having a controversy, there's enough upside there and a low enough risk where it's worth putting him in sooner rather than later just so that you can have your team better set up for a possible playoff. Yeah, and I really like the way that you went at it. And I, I guess since I have uh, both you guys on, one of the questions that I, I wanted to ask you guys in terms of, you know, making the decision with, uh, with, with you know, Teddy Bridgewater going in, Case Keenum going in, would this be something that you would approach a little bit like, you know, you're trailing in a game and at some point you're going to need to get a two-point conversion? Like, I feel like this is one of those things and just me looking at it that it's better to find out sooner rather than later which way that you need to go. Um, like, Am I looking at this the right way, or is this some of this that you know you just kind of need to ride things out with Case Keenum for another couple of weeks, make your decision, or um, is it better to find out if Teddy can or can't play, you know, right away, even if it means that you know it might be bad in the short term for you? I really like that. Yeah, yes. What are your what are your thoughts uh, on it? Obviously, Eric, knowing that you know Case. Uh, I mean, in that first half against Washington, I think he probably played the best half of football he's ever played in his entire life. Obviously, he uh, he came you know back towards the mean a little bit there in the in the second half. But I guess what are your thoughts on on really how things should be approached? Not necessarily from uh, just strictly a player evaluation standpoint, but maybe just from a larger scale, looking at it from just a, a strategic standpoint. 
Yeah, I think that there's, I think the majority of people who, you know, watch football, study football, play coach would, you know, kind of go against what I'm going to say, which is like, you know, you should kind of, whether or not uh, you, you know, you can win the game with two scores or, you know, whether or not you need a field goal or not, that kind of thing. Try to go for the most points you can um, on a given drive and then, you know, take your chances later. Um, and, you know, I think that that's, you know, that's embedded in a lot of the things that, you know, folks do. They You almost never see a team go for two-point conversion. Uh, you know, when they're down nine, they'll generally, you know, kick the extra point, save the two-point conversion for later on. Um, and and that's unfortunate, I think, um, because I do think that you just give up, especially in a league where scoring is up, scoring opportunities. So, you know, trying to, you know, figure out what you need on those scoring opportunities is probably more important um, than sort of waiting it out and then wondering, you know, after a missed two-point conversion, sort of wondering, oh, could I have tied the could I have tied the game or not? I also think, like, a lot of teams, for example, will kick the extra point when they're up by seven um, as opposed to going for two and trying to bury a team by going up nine. Um, those are things that I, I, I very much find appealing uh, in terms of, um, you know, kind of, like, strategies and things of that nature – um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm of the same degree. I think, I think people could actually employ game theory within football a lot better, uh, than they currently do for sure. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, you know, Luke, you know, being the, the humble person that he is, you know, he, he, he undersold it a bit, but the article is really, 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 really good. It breaks down really, you know, again, it's it's more about the the process and and really determining you know what your upside, what your downside, using a bit of game theory to to really help you make uh, the decision that you know potentially could have the most upside for the team. And so, link to it in the show notes. I I highly suggest that, uh, that anyone listening to this go out and read the piece if you haven't already, um, because it is a very good one. And so, uh, you know, with that, I'm going to make this really clumsy segue into the, really the the main topic, the main thing we wanted to talk about in tonight's show, which is, you know, offensive line play and, and the actual importance of offensive line play when we're talking about the success of an offense. Because that's one of the things, especially as it pertains to the Vikings this year, that's really been, you know, bandied about a lot is that. All, a lot of or a large degree of how successful the Vikings have been this year is really attributable to the fact that the offensive line is so much better than it was, uh, you know, in years past. And so, Eric, I'll flip it to you to, to kind of get us going on this one here. And obviously, you know, working at PFF, you have access to a lot of data that really would help in, in kind of that offensive line evaluation. Um, how important is offensive line play overall I mean, we saw the Cowboys get taken apart because Tyron Smith wasn't in the game. Um, like, how important is offensive line play when you're talking about, you know, fielding an offense that is good or, you know, ab- you know above average or uh, or really good? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I think the answer is very complicated because we all would agree, especially Vikings fans would agree that offensive line play matters, right? The, the last season, you know, the Vikings were very much a sieve on the offensive line long and it basically tanked their season um and yet at the same time like if you look at the numbers if you look at like things like pff grades offensive line play whether that be run blocking or pass blocking are kind of down the down the list a little bit so if you look at like how well the team passes the ball how well the team catches the ball um those sorts of things are actually more important than 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 pass block you know pass blocking and run blocking um, and then, but then there's a little twist to it too, I think. And, and statistically speaking, it's actually more advantageous to go from average offensive line than it is to go from an average offensive line to an elite offensive line, which is sort of, you know, kind of interesting, right? Because it's, it's very like, you know, it's very hard to, to sort of, um, you know, it's very hard to like, like tease that average, right? I, I think it's, I think it's far more, I think it's far more um, simple to say, okay, let's, let's draft Matt Khalil and fourth pick overall and hope he's elite. Right. And, you know, but the benefits of going from, 
uh, TJ Clemmings to Riley Reef, who I would consider an average to an above average tackle, as we've found are so substantial. Um, and then, of course, and we'll talk about this, I think, maybe a little bit later, is that the differentials in how, you know, how valuable different positions are, are also very interesting. So, um, yeah, offensive line play certainly matters. Um, and as you said, the Cowboys, you know, finding out what, it, what it, how bad it is to go from um, elite to bad. I mean, that's a huge drop off. So, um, yeah, it's, inter- it's a very interesting topic to study for sure. Yeah, I, I really find it interesting that like a bad offensive line can do more damage than a good offensive line can actually help you. It's like there's this kind of ceiling to the impact that an offensive line can have. But I guess it totally makes sense. I and mean, if you're giving up a bunch of pressures, you're sabotaging the offense. But if you aren't, the offense still has to function behind that. And you still have to have a quarterback that can throw out of those screen pockets and wide receivers that can run their routes and stuff. Uh, so I find that really interesting. It's it's just so counterintuitive. Like you say, you know, hey, one team has the twenty fifth best offensive line, one team has the fifteenth best offensive line, and one team has the fifth best offensive line. You would expect those to kind of be like evenly affected teams, and they're not. And I find that really, really like a fascinating core of offensive line play. Yeah, and it, and it is funny. And it's something that aligns with, um, you know, a, I guess a bit of, of research I was doing early in the year when I was kind of trying to determine the impact of, you know, the offensive line upgrades the Vikings were going to do. Um, when we when I was trying to assess, you know, how Sam Bradford's season was going to go, and, and it was uh, one of those things that I actually uh, sent Eric a DM because I was kind of surprised, actually, to, to find that the relationship between offensive line play and quarterback play wasn't really as as strong as it's often portrayed to be um you know in the media it wasn't a really the the correlation between the the two was something that i really expected to be you know a very strong one and and it wasn't that and so i reached out to eric to find out you know if i'd messed up the numbers and he gotta let me know like no that's at the at the extremes yes it is something that you know a tj clemens as we well know will destroy your offense because you don't have time to really do anything. But then once you get into that kind of middle of the road, the gains kind of go away once you once you have, you know, competent skill players, competent quarterback play, et cetera. So that was something that I found really interesting. And it's one of those things that I think you can see, you know, play out you know, to varying degrees of success because I think that, you know, the theory of your offensive line doesn't have to be great in order for you to have, you know, a uh, functional or even a good offense is something that I'm sure someone with some kind of a background in Seattle, uh, some kind of a numbers background in Seattle kind of laid out for them because it seemed at some point they went very aggressively in Seattle away from the, we're going to have a great offensive line and we're just going to get weapons. But over time, it seems that they've gone way too far to the extremes to where they ended up having to go make moves to kind of try any way to bring it back into the middle. So, um, yeah, like you said, teasing it out and finding that that middle of the road spot is uh, is really the thing there. And I guess, you know, Eric, as you think about you know how teams might look to optimize something like this as they move forward, I guess, what are your thoughts on on really the best way to to construct an offensive line to maximize that uh, that value for your team, especially as you know, you know. If you Drake, if you can draft them all and, and hit on all of your offensive line draft picks, hooray! But obviously, we know that's not going to happen. So, if you were going to go at it and, and try to construct the, you know, the optimal offensive line, what would what would be your strategy for doing so? Yeah, I mean, I think you know there are certainly positions that I've all I've heard people and then you know talk about within the NFL, but also you heard it, you know. Um, Uh, written about and things like that. And, you know, there are positions where, you know, for a right-handed offense, for example, the team certainly like can hide. And then there are some positions where the team sort of let the guy out an island. So left guard was one of those where like the, the idea was that, you know, because most quarterbacks are right-handed, you know, the, the, the center will shade left after, after the snap on passing plays and the guard sort of more helping out the left tackle. So that left guard guy is, you know, not necessarily blocking people one-on-one as much. And so that's sort of more of a throwaway position. You sort of look at the way the Vikings have constructed their offensive line. It seems to hold true with Nick Easton kind of being the weakest link on the offensive line. Um, And 
you know, whereas right guards are sort of left on an island by themselves more often. They're also, you know, when teams are right-handed in the run game, they sort of like, you know, in terms of run blocking, that position is, is super important. And so I like sort of dug into the data and we have, you know, expected points added models. We also have like each, each player on each play is graded. Um, and in the passing game, we give guys only negative grades. Um, if they don't do their job, so it's a little skewed. And then through normalization, we give them positive grades if they don't give up pressure. But like, um, basically, the idea is that you know, in pass blocking, the a negative grade by a left guard is the least influential on an offensive line uh, on on the team that they're playing for. And it's not really particularly close. The the next most important is right guard, followed by center, followed by right tackle, and then as we I think of all hypothesized, left tackle has been you know the a negative grade by a left tackle is the most negatively influential on an offense. You know, pretty interesting. I think that comes from the fact that, like, not only are, are sacks given up by left tackle, you know, pretty influential, but those are, like, the ones on the blind side where strips can happen and sort of turnovers and those types of things um, can occur. Interestingly, in the run game, the tackle is the most important position as well. Right and left tackle about the same, center, third, and then both guard positions are basically the, the least influential in the run game um, but what we found there is actually those the correlations between grades are actually important there too so there's all these like combo blocks that really matter as well so that out and and so you know if you're having difficulty you know finding certain positions over other positions the data would certainly suggest tackle is probably the most important followed by center and then uh, if you have to sort of slough off on the guards and and, you know, interestingly for the Vikings, that's not really how they've approached free agency uh, of late, right, with going after Alex Boone uh, and the like. Yeah, I guess, like, because of the way the offensive line is constructed now, you know, you have Riley who kind of comes up for a while, and like, uh, maybe you want to look at replacing Mike Renner soon, but, like, I've seen mock drafts where there's all kinds of... Uh, like, I've seen mock drafts with guards being knocked to the Vikings in the first round all the time. Um, and if you say, say Isadora is going to be the starting right guard or whatever, you know, are, are we going to spend our first round draft pick on left guard? And if we are, is that unwise because of, you know, the kind of low impact that they can have even if they're playing at their best? Because, like, not only is left guard the least impactful, but as we just discussed, good offensive line play versus not bad offensive line play is also not that impactful. So. Are we really going to hunt for a superstar on the offensive line, or should we wait for the third round and kind of get one of those middle of the road guys like we did with with Elfline and Isadora? Yeah, and I guess that raises a, a a very good point, especially as Vikings fans, because one of the things that was criticized fairly heavily for for Rick Spielman was the fact that he, you know, outside of you know going Matt Khalil, who was was uh, was drafted early. He tended to look for those interior linemen, you know, very late in the draft and kind of go with a, a quantity over quality type of strategy. But you know, based on what you're seeing, you know, with the numbers, Eric, I guess was was Rick Spielman kind of doing it the right way, just kind of, you know, hit with some bad luck in terms of injuries to John Sullivan and things like that, or, or should maybe he have adjusted a little bit earlier uh to to go after that center position that is uh, a bit more important a little bit earlier, like he did to find a player like Pat Elflin. Yeah, I mean, part of drafting is just drafting the right guys. And then part of drafting is luck, too. So, you know, I think the TJ Clemmings one, I think the process of drafting him was fine. He was a good football player in college. He just didn't work out. I think the process of drafting Willie Beavers, not so much, right? Like he, his college football PFF grades were not great. Um, so he kind of ended up like expected. Um, you know, for a long time, teams were not drafting interior linemen in the first round. So, I think the Vikings were sort of following suit there. And then, of course, they just whiffed on a left tackle, right, with Khalil. Um, so I'm not exactly sure in terms of, you know, whether we should knock them so much. But, um, you know, they also have had a difficult time finding a quarterback over the last, you know, basically decade. So they've had to use a, two first-round picks on quarterbacks during that time as well. So first-round picks a team can have and – and a lot of times they've like sort of moved up to get guys like Patterson or Smith. And then they, you know, their subsequent picks are like gone then. So, you know, 
I, I think part of it is just drafting the right players. I think development is also a key issue. You know, they, they got rid of uh, Jeff Davidson uh, as the offensive line coach uh, after the 2015 season. Sperano seems to have, you know, done the job this year. And last season he was very criticized. So it's kind of an all, all encompassing thing. You know, they signed the wrong free agent in Andre Smith. Um, you know, and then, you know, we, we got some bad luck on Mike Harris, right? I mean, Mike Harris had a really good year in 2015. And, and so what are you supposed to, you know, what are you going to do? Um, Brandon Fusco got hurt, you know, he was having a good career and then he got hurt. So I think with the Vikings kind of now in the future, now that they've, they've demonstrated the ability to put together a competent offensive line, I think I'll chalk up the, the previous few seasons to luck, right? I mean, there was a 2,000 yard rushing season amongst one of Rick Spielman's GM years, right? So it hasn't all been bad up front for them. Yeah, and the uh, kind of the when you when you were talking about kind of the the importance of the different positions, um, that that seemed to be kind of in reference to the passing game. Which, generally speaking, if you're talking about an offense, the passing game is the more important part of the offense if you're trying to have a very strong offense, which is something, again, as Vikings fans, I think we should know very well from the Adrian Peterson era. But is there a position uh, that is, you know, I guess wildly more important when you're talking about the run game from a, from an offensive line perspective, or are they all fairly kind of equally important when you're talking about having a successful run game? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it depends upon the scheme. You know, if you're a zone team or a – of a power team or a gap scheme team. Um, but, you know, you know, in the, in the run game is not necessarily particularly important to offenses, as you said. So um, I wouldn't go ahead and build my team to build a good running game. Um, and then, so, you know, in, in that, in that respect, uh, I think it's relatively moot in, ter in terms of how you, um, you know, go ahead and build the offensive line. Um, I would start with a pass game first and sort of, see what happens with the run game as a corollary. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess, Luke, did you have any uh, any questions or any comments you wanted to make pertaining to uh, kind of what Eric's brought up in terms of which positions are more important or, you know, based on what you've heard, you know, how you would go about, you know, attacking an offensive line rebuild if you were, you know, given the, uh, the, the job as GM? Yeah, one thing that I see debated a lot during like free agency time or draft time is like left tackles getting paid so much more than right tackles. And that seems like a little bit of a market inefficiency to me because the difference between left tackles and right tackles in terms of like value added, left tackles add a little more, but like it's still close enough to where like the contracts are very disproportionate right now. The left tackle market is a nightmare. We saw last offseason, like, people paying off the most from that career and Russell O'Kane, and like, he's proven to be bad players. Um, and the right tackle market is still probably more inflated than it should be, but far less so. So if I'm going to go out and have to get like a premier free agent offensive lineman because my offensive line is bad, I think I would go after the right tackle market more because it just seems like I'm going to get a little bit more bang for my buck. Um, and I also think centers are really, really important if only for this sort of unquantifiable factor of uh, centers who can like call out protections correctly, and especially if you have a young player that take that off his plate, um, that can be really important too. So I would probably go for a good center and a good right tackle, um, and hope that I can hit on a left tackle in the draft, or, or hope that I can get one that's maybe more of the middle of the road, but serviceable and, and you know, hope that I don't have to do like a bunch of guaranteed money and let myself into that better like what the Panthers are doing. Yeah, that, that that makes a lot of sense to me. I guess, uh, yeah, Eric, you in line with uh, with where Luke's coming from on that one? Yep. Yeah, I think I think you know we again. I think we have to when we when we look at when we look at the data and we look at you know statistics and how they you know how we try to build teams. I think we have to look at what the you know the most predictive things are and you know build from there and then kind of work around any inefficiencies that would come from that well all right i feel like you know we we've covered most of the bases on uh, on the offensive line piece but uh, there's there's definitely i can't let eric escape from here without getting his 
kind of preliminary take. I know you can't give us all of the goods, but by most accounts, the Rams seem to be a better team than the Vikings in most systems, you know, DVOA, et cetera. The Rams are ranked ahead of the Vikings. So I think the line, someone on Twitter posted today, the line post uh, opened up with the Rams as, as two-point favorites. Is What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I saw the Vikings as two point favorites earlier, but you know, in in terms of in terms of the uh, in terms of like you know looking at how to handicap a game, you know, being the home team is generally worth something like two and a half, three points. Um, so basically, what the odds makers were saying there is that the Rams are a little bit better than the Vikings. Um, I think what you have to do when you're trying to look at a game like this is to dig deeper into like what the Rams you know, resume looks like, and I, you know, they have to beat the teams in front of them. So, you know, I'm not going to negate the, the, the strong, you know, play that they've had against teams like the Giants, against teams like the 49ers and, and the Colts and, um, and the uh, Houston Texans without Deshaun Watson. But, you know, that stuff matters. When they've played teams that are a little stronger, you know, they play Dallas, they beat Dallas on the road. That's a impressive when they when they played Seattle they lost to Seattle at home they lost to Washington at home right so there's there's something there there in terms of like the strength of schedule thing being a thing was roll the Vikings this week I think they're pretty legit but I think the the jury's still out as far as the Vikings are concerned I think um you know it all depends upon you know how how healthy their defense is and if their defense can you know really adjust to this sort of innovative offense that the Rams have um and, you know, and I don't think that their defense, aside from Aaron Donald, is particularly talented, um, but he, Aaron Donald's, like, probably the best player in the entire league, so they, they're going to have to neutralize him. Um, I think they're weak as a run defense, uh, especially, you know, having – is one of those sort of myths in the NFL. Um, Alec, uh, not Alex Barron. Um, Mark Barron is, is a safety playing inside linebacker, so that's a huge deal. Um, so I think the Vikings will be able to run on them. I, I think that two points, you know, Vikings two point favorites. I, I I'm pretty, you know, ba- uh, bullish on the Vikings in that one. So, or a person inclined to bet on the Vikings, uh, you have my blessing, I guess. That is what we like to hear. We have Eric's blessing to uh, that that feels like confidence in the Vikings going into this game, Eric. I like that. I like it. Yeah, I mean, hey, if they can keep, like, let's say, perfect scenario, right? right? We all have tipped our hands here. They're down 10-7 at halftime. Keenum's thrown a couple picks. But, they're, but the defense is, like, held serve a couple times. Put Teddy in the second half. A couple scoring drives. Teddy, you know, the LaMarcus Joyner revenge tour, right? And, uh, you know, Vikings getting the win column there. <laughs> LaMarcus Joyner revenge tour. I love it. I love it. Luke, what are your thoughts? You know that uh, you're 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 out there, so you know. I guess what's the what's the vibe? What's the buzz out your way? And and, and what are your thoughts on on this matchup uh, with the Vikings and the Rams? I, I'm excited for it just from a strategy perspective because I like um, the Sean McVay versus Mike Zimmer thing, um, and I've been looking at what Sean McVay does, and a lot of Jared Goff's deficiencies have come because that offense is a lot of like slow developing stuff um spelled by a bunch of screens so they kind of i feel like they they do a bunch of wrong plays like invite you to blitz and then they screen at you so if if the vikings can can accurately or can uh, efficiently defend those screens and, and you can get enough of like the lateral movement from linebackers to keep the production on screens low and if the vikings can get pressure with four which i think they can um you know, those long plays are going to start to get Garrett Goff to struggle under pressure. Um, his pass rating under pressure isn't that bad, but it certainly takes a big, like, 30 point dip from when he was under pressure. He's, he's been having a great year, but I think, I don't know, even, even though, like, in terms of production, I would say that, like, against a neutral team, the Rams would have a better chance of beating that neutral team than the Vikings do. But I really like the way the Vikings match up just because of the strategy the Rams take. Feels like they play right into our strengths. Yep, that uh, that 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 all, yeah, that feels fair. Like this is one of those matchups that you know, bo- and I'm not gonna lie. Before we played the 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 Redskins, I was uh, probably a bit more confident in this matchup, and that I felt like 
uh, Zimmer would be able to to you know, get pressure on Jared Goff and kind of knock him off his game a little bit. I am interested to see how much of uh, you know the strategy that was employed by the the skins uh, the, that the Rams pick up in this week because uh, it seemed like there were many occasions where the skins were able to outflank us and. Based on just kind of the, the preliminary clips that I've seen, you know, people post, it looks like the Rams like to do a lot of those things as well. So it will be interesting to see if, if uh, the team was able to, to to tighten up on those things because, you know, Chris Thompson one-on-one on, on a screen pass um, is a lot different deal than, you know, Todd Gurley one-on-one on, on one of those screen passes. So, uh, yeah, I hope we, we, we got some of those things figured out so that we're, we're, we're not leaving our guys in those types of situations this week. Yeah, and you know Jared Goff this season is second in the NFL in, in passer rating when using play action. So I think you know it's pretty clear that you know that it's important for the Vikings to you know stop the run on first and second down so that they're not in these advantageous positions to be throwing you know bubble screens and things like that uh, to the Robert Woodses of the world. Um, I think that the Vikings, you know, as Luke said, don't match up on the outside. Like they have three solid receivers, and I think it's you know a really good testament to their front office to go from a team that could not move the ball last year to, you know, a team that's been very good on offense this season. Um, But it's not, you're not talking about receivers that are, you know, that are going to stretch them too much. So um, I'm, you know, I'm pretty, you know, like I said, bullish on the Vikings this week. And Oh my goodness. I just went and looked. green Bay is really the underdog this week at home. Oh, Oh, wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you, yeah, but you know what? You're talking about two backup quarterbacks again. Like those are tough games to bet. It's true, but that's just. Uh, I mean, I like seeing it. It's just. Uh, it's it's very surprising to me. Yeah. All right. Sure. I feel like we covered everything that we were going to cover this week. I guess Eric. Uh, I know it's the usual stuff here, but uh, you know, when can we find you talking to people about you know how they should uh, gamble their money this week? Yeah, so I'm on, uh, you know, Pro Football Focus. Uh, the ELO ratings will come out tomorrow. And then uh, on Friday, uh, my buddy George and I are going to do our spread picks. Um, we'll also be on the PFF podcast. Um, for those of you that are fans of 1500 ESPN, I'm on the Purple Podcast. I think I recorded sometime today. Uh, so it'll be sometime. It'll be out sometime this week. I'm talking about, you know, the some of the underneath the underneath the hood reasons why Teddy Bridgewater is a, a better prospect than a lot of people think. I'm sort of looking at him, you know, when kept clean, and sort of looking at him on third and long. So not not things that are sort of different than we we've, we've discussed, but you know, the debate is going to probably go on until he's the starter. So sort of you know chatting about that. So yeah, pretty fun week. Yeah, looking forward to that. You and uh, you and Collar have a good rapport, so I like it when uh, you, when you make those appearances on uh, on Purple Podcast. And uh, yeah, and and Collar is someone who also likes the the numbers. He he gives you a lot of latitude to get in there. So I'll be looking forward for that one as well. I guess Luke, obviously, you had the piece dropped uh, earlier today. Uh, what else can we be looking for from you as we get uh, deeper into the week? Yeah, as always, I'll be on the uh, Purple Journal uh, over at Purple PTSD, and I will be live tweeting the game from. PTSD's Twitter account, as always. Um, hopefully, by the time the, the Purple Journal comes out, I'll have a little bit more research coming in there and I'll have a better idea of uh, how I would attack them if I were if I was being spoken staff, because I think that's always a really fun kind of result to go down. Um, and yeah, you can know, Twitter and argue with me about stuff. Well, all right then. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you uh, once again for coming on recording with me tonight. Uh, Eric, good luck grading the papers. Luke, uh, <laughs> have fun out on uh, on the best coast, and uh, I will talk to you gentlemen again soon. Take care. All right, see you guys. <laughs>